All right, so let's go through the, uh, to the last step, which is the most complicated step, is the perspective uh, projection, this uh, transformation from the view thrust to the orthographic view volume. So um, <clears throat> let's, uh, let's see what we have to do when we want to do this kind of transformation. So for example, if we have the, uh, the view thrust and we have two triangles here, which are about are the same size. So let's assume they, they are the same size here. Then we need them to be transformed in a way that, or if we do the transformation correctly, you will see of course that the one that is further away will be smaller because if you look at this on the screen, of course, the one that is further away appears smaller, even if in reality it has the same size. So if we would do an orthographic projection here directly, it would lead to two triangles that have the same size. But since the one that is further away appears smaller, we have to do the transformation in a way that these relative sizes are preserved based on the set axis. So uh, to uh, understand what we, what we need to do here or what, uh, how this relates to each other, I uh, copied this image, which is surprisingly not in the third edition of the book anymore, but it was from the second edition of the book. And it kind of uh, illustrates what happens for the perspective and the parallel projection. So for the perspective projection, we said that it is defined by mathematically by um, projecting the points in our scene to the screen along a line between the point and the viewer. And then the intersection between this line and the, the screen is the point on the image. So if this is our viewing plane, this is our eye vector, our viewpoint, and this is an object here, then we project it on a line towards the eye vector. And this intersection point with the viewing plane here is then of course where we have this point on the screen. So if this is our point x, y, z, then it becomes to this point x, s, y, s here on the screen. Of course, um, all other points that are on this line are also projected towards this point here. And if, of course, if they are behind each other, then if this is a solid object, we will not see this other object. But if we want to project that, this would be exactly the one point where all objects that are on this line will be projected to. Now the uh, <coughs> parallel projection was defined as the intersection point between the screen, uh, the viewing plane and a line that is perpendicular to this plane that is parallel to the viewing direction. So we have all the points that are for example on this line here will be projected towards this point here. So this is then also x, s, y, s. But here we see that here we already have x, s, y, s set because the x and the y axis uh, coordinates don't change. But we also see, of course, that all the points on this line are projected towards this point here on the screen. They are all mapped on this one single pixel on the screen. So if we now want to create the very same image with perspective projection, then we can create, no, the other way around. If we want to create the very same image with orthographic projection that we could with perspective projection, what we have to do, we have to do a transformation where all the points on this line are mapped, of course, to all two points on this line in the same order as they are on this line here. So it's basically saying we take the intersection point and then we flip this line or rotate it around this intersection point till it becomes parallel to this viewing direction that we have here. And then of course we get the very same image if we do an orthographic projection with this transformed line here than if we do a perspective projection with the original line. The very same image if and only if of course the order of the set coordinates is preserved. So uh, if we fr try to phrase that in, uh, in conditions, what we do is we map the lines that go through the origin to lines parallel to the set axis, that is this rotation step, but just parallel to the set axis isn't enough. It also has to be, of course, 
a rotation around this intersection point here, which is specified here verbally as map points on the viewing plane to themselves. So if this point on the viewing plane is, of course, the intersection point, so we rotate around this intersection point. So if our scene has a point that is on the viewing plane, it doesn't change its x and y coordinate. Also, it doesn't change its z coordinate, of course. If for the other points, if they are on the far plane, they should stay on the far plane, of course, because, oops, sorry. If we have a far plane here and a point is here and we project it, for example, if we do a rotation like this and it is here, then we don't draw it anymore because it is behind the far plane. So we have to make sure that points on the far plane stay on the far plane. And then for the points in between, we say we have to preserve the near to far order which of course also makes sense because if we would switch that, for example, if we would map this point here, and let's assume this point would not be here, then we would of course not draw this point here when we do the projection, but we would draw this point here because this one is then behind it. So we have to preserve the order. Now the obvious or straightforward question is why do I say preserve the order? Why do we not just take the same set axis? Because if we, let's draw it here, if we rotate this down, the most straightforward thing would be just keep the same set axis. Why do I was it drawn here in such a weird way that they move, but just under the condition that they that the order is preserved? And the answer is, of course, first of all, it doesn't matter because uh, as long as the order is preserved, we get the very same image. And the good thing that it doesn't matter is that. If we do not preserve the set axis, then we can do it with matrix multiplication. If we preserve the set axis, we cannot do it as easily with matrix multiplication. That's why we have this, this condition here. Good. So um, <coughs> let's see how we can uh, actually calculate those values, those x, s, and y, s on the screen. And this is, uh, we can easily see that by looking at this uh, 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 triangle uh, relationship that we have here, that we know from uh, basic geometry, we have the i vector and we have a distance to the screen and now we have a point here x y set so we also know the set axis of this point here and from the triangle we see here that the relation between this distance and the set value of the point is the same as the relation between this point projected on the screen or the intersected with the viewing plane with this the y coordinate of this one, of course, for the x coordinate, it's just the same, just pointing out of the screen. So this is just for the y coordinate, but you have the same relationship for the set, uh, for the uh, for the x coordinate. So uh, we all we know all this here, and we know the relationship between them is this here, and this is the x y x as this is the variable, this is the value that we want to find. So we can just transform this, and then we have y s we can we know we can calculate the y s value by d divided by the set value of the point times the original y value of the point so this is our formula how to calculate the point location on the screen same for the x value problem is of course if we want to do this with matrix multiplication we have a problem we cannot do division with matrix multiplication so this is the val these are the values that we want for x and y we want to do matrix we do want to uh, we need a division. The set value, we just have these conditions specified, so we need to extend our matrix uh, framework, because so far we're doing everything with, with matrices. There's only one step in between where we cannot do matrix multiplication, so we want to extend our framework in a way that we can also do matrix multiplication here, and that should sound familiar. We had a situation before when we were moving from uh, linear transformations to affine transformations, which also include translations, we also said, yeah, it would be nice to also do it with matrix multiplication because we can do everything else with matrix multiplication. And we extended our framework by adding the homogeneous coordinates. And that gave us the possibility not only to produce these kind of values, same also, of course, for uh, y dash and z dash, <coughs> but also to produce values where we add a constant factor here. And now we will do another extension of this matrix framework, which is called the, uh, which allows us to do so-called projective transformation. The name uh, should, of course, be obvious from the perspective transformation uh, that we want to do. And um, 
the, uh, that will allow us to create values like this. Now that looks very, very complicated, but of course you see here by choosing the E, F, G and H values appropriately, we will be able to create an X, S coordinate that is the uh, a constant times X divided by set by just choosing uh, the other value zero, we will be able to use that. And this is the, uh, the so this is the, the extension that we are going to make. And um, <clears throat> the question now is, of course, how we can we transform a vector into this representation by matrix multiplication? Remember, in the previous case, when we went to the homogeneous coordinates, we added a fourth dimension. And this is also the thing that will help us here. We take this advantage of this fourth dimension. But in the homo case of homogeneous coins, we always had a one as the fourth coordinate. And now we're just using a different value here in the fourth coordinate and then call this the value W and then later divide through that value. And that will uh, enable us to do this kind of transformation with matrix multiplication. So uh, it sounds a little complicated at first, but if you go through it with an example, you will see that it's actually just pretty straightforward. So the trick is basically just we use this additional line that we have just to carry around some values and to uh, arrange them in a way that the calculation kind of works out in the way we want to. So um, if you remember homogeneous coordinates, we used this representation of a point x, y, z. So we just added a fourth coordinate with value one. Now for this other extension that we do, we represent it by, uh, we, we use another, uh, another, we use again the fourth coordinate, but we have not just one, but we just have a value w there. And that does not represent the point x, y, z, but it represents the point x divided by y, y divided by y, and uh, by w, and z divided by w. Yeah, it's, you see, it's, it's uh, you always make these mistakes when explaining because it looks so, so complex, but like I said, if you go through it with a simple example, you will see that it's uh, actually quite straightforward and quite simple. Good, and then of course the matrix multiplication we also change by saying we do not just have 0, 0, 0, 1 values here for the homogeneous coordinates, but we allow any kind of values here. And these are then exactly the EFGH values that we will later show up in our result in the denominator. Good. And then, of course, like I said, our point is not represented with a vector with a 1 in the fourth coordinate, but with a value W in the fourth coordinate. So if we want to later draw it, then this represents not the point X, Y, Z, but the point x divided by this value. So we have to divide before we draw it. So, um, <clears throat> um, so let's see how we can, how we can, uh, uh, so, so in a, uh, augmenting matrices in this way by adding a row and this uh, fourth coordinate to the points allows us to, uh, to, um, to divide, to, to create coordinates where we have also a division, but, uh, and also doesn't influence our, our calculation otherwise. So let's, let's see how we do that. First, let's see if that really fits into the framework that we already have, because of course the motivation why we do matrix multiplication is that we say, that was just the one step that we couldn't do with matrix multiplication. So if we make an extension, we have to make sure that the original framework still work, that we're not screwing something up there because then the whole motivation for doing it in the first place would be, uh, would be lost. So, and of course we can easily see this if we set the EFGH values in the same way as we do with the homogeneous coordinates. So if we set it this way, then of course our resulting vector becomes X, Y, Z, W, which is then here also a one, because you see here one, and then in the last row zeros and one, that will result in a value W is one. And that represents this point here. And then we have, we said we have to, to draw it, we have to divide by this value here, which of course is one. So I explicitly wrote it here to make it clear. Although of course it is clear that this is just the X, Y and Z value. So we see it fits into our framework. We can still use the original matrices in relation to that when we do the calculation. The question now is of course, how when we extend this, 
how do we <coughs> so so we, we no uh, to to summarize we take a point multiply it with this extended matrix then we get these kind of uh, values here which represent a point in these homogeneous coordinates and to draw them we have to do another step which is called the homogenization which is dividing by this value w here which leads then exactly to the thing that I had at the beginning and we see here that this is one so this is again our original homogeneous coordinates so we can then have here the x y and z coordinate and can just draw them in a regular way and the question now is of course how do we pick those values for the matrix to get exactly this result that we want which is nx divided by z and y divided by z and the z value following these conditions that we specified and the last one a one that is of course already clear because we see here that is obviously one and um, the uh, the other values of course that's not that straightforward to see but I just uh, we can just look it up and then prove that it is indeed the case and uh, I claim that this is the matrix that will work out so you see here if you compare this to homogeneous coordinates you do not have a row its uh, zeros and just a one at the end but some completely different values and these are then of course our E F G and H values and um, so let's see if that really gives us what we want if we multiply this with a point x y z one then we get this value here and then we do the homogeneous coordinate uh, the homogenization which is dividing by this value which is the same as uh, multiplying by n divided by z which gives us exactly the x and the y values that we want the fourth coordinate is of course obviously clear that it's also correct the only thing that we that we cannot obviously see is does this set value really specify really fulfill all the conditions that we had that is do the same the points on the near and far plane have the same set value and do the orders for all the values in between not change but that we can easily prove so this is our set value that we have after we apply the projective matrix if set is on the near plane that means we get here minus f so n plus f minus f is obviously n so that is our set value uh, that stays on the near plane because we had this here so that is correct same if set is on the far plane then this becomes minus n so it re it's, it's reduced to f f was set so set n is f f what is that f so that's correct now it's correct so and uh, so the first condition is confilled for uh, the first two far plane and near plane um, another thing we have to prove of course is that if a value is within the view frustum it doesn't move out of the view frustum but we also see this that if it is larger than the near plane so it's behind the near plane then um, then this value here is larger than zero but that also means that this value is larger than zero n plus anything that is larger than zero is of course larger than n so this is also correct likewise we see it here if z is smaller than f we just have to look into this value and then we'll also see that this is uh, these two values here then we'll see that this is indeed also smaller than f so if the values are within the view frustum they stay within the view frustum now the only thing left is to make sure that the order of them is also preserved and that we can easily so that means if we have a value that has a higher set a point with a higher set value than another one then after transformation its set value is still higher and uh, we can see this by this transformation actually it makes more sense to uh, from the proof to look at it from the bottom up if this condition is fulfilled set one is larger than set two we can transform it in a way that this condition is also uh, th that then this condition must also be fulfilled it's just a simple mathematic transformations 
and then we can multiply this with fn and also uh, with minus fn and we can add f and n here so we see here this are both the same on both sides so this is another simple arithmetic transformation but these are exactly the conditions here that lead to what we want to prove here so we see also that this is correct so we see that we do <coughs> a correct transformation for the set value and we get the correct x and y value but for the set transformation um, the order is preserved but it's also important to look into how the order is preserved uh, when we do the, the calculation later and you see here these are all constant values the only variable here is set so we see set s is proportional to 1 minus 1 divided by set so if we draw this if this is set S and this is set, then set S is proportional to 1 divided, minus 1 divided by set, by set. But that means if we map that, that note, that means that points that are close onto the screen are mapped to distances that are further away from each other, whereas points that are far away are mapped to distances that are closer to each other. Now, of course, we can do the mapping only within a specific range. So if we make something go away, go out, go make a distance between two points larger, we have to make it smaller at another point. But the clever way here is that if an object is further away, the accuracy goes down because they are mapped to set positions closer to each other but if it is closer the distance gets the set value gets increased which also means if you have small rounding errors you get the artifacts only for objects that are very far away which is where you probably won't see it that much anyhow but at close positions you get a higher accuracy because of this uh, mapping function so we do not only have a mapping function here that preserves the order but preserves it in a very clever way that makes uh, our images maybe look uh, even life even nicer good yeah and then we can uh, of course uh, have a matrix for this so we have to combine this with the other matrices with the matrix that we had for the orthographic projection then we get this matrix here and um, <coughs> Then, of course, we put it in the whole framework. So we see here, this here, this um, orthographic, we, we combined this here, this um, the M orthographic matrix, which is perspective matrix, is this one here. So we see here, we just add another matrix here, which is our matrix P into a multiplication. And originally, with the previous one, we had a parallel projection, and now we have a perspective projection we see we can just do this with a, con uh, a sequence of five matrices or we can multiply them with each other and then we have just one matrix that does the whole 3d transformation so you see here how uh, we split this process of one complex matrix into much simpler single processes and use then the single matrices to do this. <coughs> now, uh, if we do this in pseudocode, um, we have to calculate our matrix first, of course. And then we draw a line segment. So the point A, I, uh, B, I are mapped to the points P, Q on the screen by multiplying them with the matrix. But then, of course, we have to be careful because we extended our framework in a way that we do not have uh, only zeros and ones in the lo lower row of the homogeneous coordinates, but this value w, which was basically just a help to, to drag away along uh, certain values that help us make this division that we need for the perspective projection, we have to, before we draw, divide by this value w to get the right points on the screen. Good. And that way we can project um, like these grid models onto the screen, but of course we also have to um, <coughs> deal with the situations that we excluded so far. So for example, if objects are completely outside of the view frustum or partly inside of it, we have to uh, see how we deal with that. If objects are overlapping each other, we have to make a decision which one we are drawing, um, so which is called hidden surface removal. And, of course, surfaces 
we do not only want to have grid, uh, grid models, but we also want to have models with texture and shading on it. We already talked about texturing and shading, but we will do more in relation to uh, the actual rasterization, the actual uh, projection about this later. So these are the kind of things that will follow then in the graphics pipeline part two and part three that we will talk about in the next upcoming lectures. Speaking of upcoming lectures, a few words on the schedule because of the exam and the Herkansing week. There will be a few changes, so let me just quickly summarize. Um, <clears throat> today there will be a third tutorial for the people who didn't have their tutorial on Thursday because of the holiday. Um, start filling up in room 61. If there is not enough, then we can also go to room 679. But if there, if it all fits in one room, then Peter and I will be both in the room. That would, would make it... Uh, more flexible for you, then uh, we can, can answer your questions faster. Um, if you already had your tutorial on Tuesday, if there is enough space, of course, you're also welcome to come today. And uh, you can also ask questions from the previous tutorials, of course. Um, because on Thursday, there will be no tutorial because uh, that was originally the exam day, which is why we didn't schedule anything. And of course, also no lecture the day before the exam. And also, we said we decided to skip the teaching uh, assistant session for the practicals because uh, I assume that most of you will learn for the exam and not do the, the programming assignment. Or if you are already so good with the, with, the, with the exam that you don't need to learn, then you will also be so good with the practicals that you don't need teaching assistance. Um, the major reason why we skipped it also is that in two weeks afterwards, there is the deadline for the second practical. And uh, the week, but the week before that is the Hakansing uh, week, so there are no officially no uh, events scheduled here. But because it's just a few days before the deadline, we thought it would be nice for you to offer you uh, some teaching assistance sessions. So we basically just move it there. We might even offer uh, longer times, but I have to discuss this with the TAs, which is why I cannot tell you the exact time slot now. Just look on the website. As soon as I have discussed it with them, I will post it on the website. So there will be, of course, the exam on Friday. I will talk about this, uh, say something about this later also. Um, the third practical will also be online, most likely on Friday, not on Thursday, like original plan, because we moved the exam. So we also moved that deadline, uh, that uh, date. Um, then next week, Thursday, we'll definitely have an additional session. We might also have then extended hour on the following Monday, extended hours on the following Monday, which is directly a day before the deadline. Uh, I'm not sure if we will extend the hours or if we'll just say we have more teaching assistants there in the original scheduled hours. Again, I have to discuss this with them because it's, uh, I mean, they're doing this basically voluntarily, so they're not getting extra pay for that. So I have to nicely ask them. Um, <clears throat> And then uh, on Tuesday, there is no regular lecture, but uh, we did this last year in the, as part of the tutorials that after the exam, Peter was discussing the exam or presenting results in the tutorial session. Um, this year, because it works out with the schedule, we thought we actually do this as part of the lecture. So uh, this is not, will not be recorded and I also will put the results online, but it is, I think, very helpful for you to, uh, to go there and uh, get them some information on the exam. Um, I think we should also be ready then with the grading, so you should have your grades by then, so you can also then see where it might have gone wrong or what you, what you did right. Um, there are no tutorials then in that week, but the practical session will take place, of course, because there is the deadline that, uh, uh, on that day. The following Thursday, again, no tutorials. The next tutorial sheet will come online after the exam because it's not part of the exam anymore. Practical session will start as usual. And as I said, the third practical assignment will go online soon. Uh, that is why we at that day also will have another introduction from at this time two of the teaching assistants, which will again not be recorded. So make sure if you uh, want to uh, want to uh, attend that, that you're uh, if you want to get the information that you attend this this lecture and then the following week it will be uh, then back to the original schedule with regular lectures also i will not be here in that week in the first week after hack hunting so if you send me an email i will check my emails but uh, don't uh, expect me to react uh, very soon it, there might be a, a delay because i have to go to a, to a conference in hong kong good um yeah so uh Two most important things, practical deadline, deadline for the practicals and exam on Friday. 
first deadline for the practical assignment. Like I said, we will offer additional teaching assistance session and support before the deadline. I cannot say exactly when now because I have to discuss it with them first, but it, I will post it online next week. So look at the website for the concrete dates. Um, of course, take advantage of that. Go there and ask them, but don't rely on it. Don't come at the very last day, uh, an hour before the deadline, and expect that they will be there and have all the time in the world to help you. Because first of all, there will be a lot of people there. We know, it, and no matter how often I tell you, do it ahead of time, uh, it will always be crowded before the deadline. And also, of course, you know that we have only have one room, which is very limited in space. So uh, also, if you have your stuff on your laptop, I recommend that you, if you have questions, bring also your laptop. So if all the computers are taken, you can still take, grab one of the TAs if he has time and uh, uh, he can explain the stuff to you. Uh, also, uh, you're encouraged to take advantage of the forum to get questions answered. Also, for example, for the weekend, I will tell the teaching assistants that they uh, should have an eye on this and make sure that they answer your questions quickly. Um, most importantly, of course, uh, plan ahead. Don't rely on mass minute help. We will do our best to help you, but you can imagine with 225 students who are registered for this course, we will not be able to answer all questions uh, one hour before the deadline. Good. Any question about the practicals? No? Good. Then the midterm exam, I mean, I basically already said most of it last time. Um, just one thing I have to say related to the actual questions, because that's something that I always uh, realize in the tutorials, and I probably should make this a little more clear. The, um, <coughs> Like I said, the lectures, the textbook, and the exercise are basically the, the basis for the exam. If you learn that and if you understand all that, you should have no problems passing the exam. But I realize that people are often confused about the, uh, the tutorials and the solutions that I provide there because I often sometimes write a lot of things and sometimes I write a lot of comments and don't even write the actual solution down. So people are confused. What would I be supposed to answer in an exam for that question? The point is the tutorials, the idea of the tutorials is that you really think about the, the stuff from the lectures and that you like uh, deepen your understanding by really going into it and, and thinking also beyond the actual question. So what I'm writing there is certainly not what we expect you in the exam. I mean, there are 200 students here in this course. If everyone writes a whole page for one answer of uh, one exercise, we are grading for like two months. Um, if you want to get an idea about how the exercise, how the questions look like in the exam, have a look at the old exams. They are posted on the old websites. So if you go to the first website uh, for the entries page on the bottom, you find a link to the previous years and there you find all the exams. Also, our Esquadrat should have them. I always sent, it, uh, sent the exams to them, so they should have them in their database. And I also always provide solutions to the exams, so you can also see what we kind of expect from you to write there. So we don't expect you to write huge uh, uh, novels there. Um, <clears throat> also, uh, one thing that might change this year, I will probably change the exam. It's not sure yet because I haven't started preparing it, but uh, I will probably change it in a way that you can now uh, have to write your answers directly on the exercise sheet because that first of all makes grading much easier and secondly it makes it easier to ask certain things because I can make a drawing and then just ask you to make some additions to the drawing for example or if you have a multiple choice question it's just easier to directly answer it on the exercise sheet. That will also change the style of the exercises a little bit but it should only make it easier for you or not easier uh, but uh, it should make it more obvious how we want the answer, not what we want, but how we want the answers. So you should not be too worried if you see the, the tutorial and you don't know how you would write concretely the answer, if that would be in an exam. In the exam, we try to make the question in a way that it is straightforward how to write the answer, if you know the correct answer. Good. 